Welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, sponsored by opednews.com, available on Pacifica Radio Network, on Progressive Radio Network, on iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud and on YouTube, and available with all the past episodes at opednews.com slash podcasts, where I am the publisher. Uh, my name is Rob Call. Uh, my guest for this show is Jeffrey Sterling. He's a former clandestine CIA case officer. He holds a law degree from Washington University. He is a formerly imprisoned whistleblower who denies the charges against him. And he's the author of a new book, Unwanted Spy, The Persecution of an American Whistleblower. Great to have you on the show. It's been real Thank honor. you very much for having me on. So, what do you want to accomplish with this book? Um, I, I think with the book, uh, to tell my story, I, I think it's an interesting one, and really to highlight that for whistleblowers uh, anywhere, I mean, they have hopes and dreams like everyone else in this country, and we love our country. And what we do, standing up to uh, wrongdoing, uh, is in the face of tremendous risk. But we do love our country, and we do have lives behind taking that risk. And I, I hope my story can show that you know there is a human side to it. And and your book really does give your side of the story, which was very different than the side that was told in court. Absolutely, uh, court. I really wasn't given the opportunity or even allowed uh, to sell my side of the story. Uh, it was really a one-sided affair, if you will. Yeah. So uh, you, you don't have a website, you don't have a Facebook page, but you do have a Twitter account, which is at sign S underscore unwanted spy. Yes. yes. So yes. people can uh, find uh, you there. It's and been a while. I mean, I, my uh, road to freedom is uh, quite, has been quite brief. I mean, I've uh, just last July came off of, of uh, probation. So uh, it's been about 20 years of me trying to get back out. <laughs> the, the ordeal lasted about 20 years, um, wow. dealing with the CIA, uh, the charges against me, investigations. And uh, so now I'm hoping to go into this new year with a newfound sense of freedom and uh, getting out there more, especially on the social networks. Great. So I, I just wanted to get some basics from you. So your job was as a clandestine CIA case officer, and that was to recruit spies and in informants. Absolutely. Yes. So, you know, I had John Kiriakou on, and he, he kind of described his job as kind of being like a James Bond type. You know, he had to go undercover, use false identities, act as someone else in order to get people to become informants and, and, and become in a sense, partners with the CIA. Is that the same kind of work you had to do? Yeah, yes, it is. I mean, uh, the way I viewed my job as a case officer, a clandestine case officer, I was a recruiter of spies. I know the, the term spy is sort of ubiquitous for the whole field of work, if you will, but um, John was absolutely right. I mean, it, it's sort of James Bondish. Uh, you, you take on the, per the persona or identities necessary to get you close to individuals that you want to try to recruit. Uh, you're looking out for people who will are willing to give up information about their, you know, classified information, if you will, uh, about their governments or, or other uh, entities. Uh, so um, there is that James Bondish uh, aspect to it. Um, all the gadgets and stuff, we didn't have that. No gadgets, no. <laughs> no gadgets, no. <laughs> okay, so now you... You had a problem, though, that where you ended up charging that there was racial discrimination. What Absolutely. did they do differently with you that caused you to charge them with racial discrimination? Well, with me, even though I had proven myself time and time again in the agency with the success of my work as a clandestine case officer, I was treated differently than other officers, than other white officers. I wasn't given the same opportunities um, as the other officers would receive. Uh, I was not uh, given the same tools necessary to do my job. What and, now, you've mentioned this in other interviews, and what are the tools that you're talking about? The tools are a proper cover to allow you to get into those avenues where you can recruit uh, spies of interest to the CIA and U.S. policymakers. 
Uh, for me, I mean, without the proper tools, especially as a clandestine officer, you're just not able to do your job. If they don't have the uh, bona fides or the uh, backstop personalities or, or identity to walk into doors of interest, then you can't do your job. Uh, for me, uh, I wasn't provided the basic tools uh, of being a case officer. Uh, and we're talk I'm talking basically about cover. Uh, my cover uh, throughout my years at the agency was little more than a janitor. Uh, and I would continually ask why I was not receiving the same cover as everyone else that, that was around me. Now, now my um, understanding is that in order to do an effective job as an undercover agent, you don't do it alone. There's no, a whole team absolutely backing not. you up. You can't and, work in a vacuum. And, and from what you're saying, that's what was not provided to you. When you talk yes. about the tools, you didn't have the team of people doing the research for you, helping you to put together your cover. And, and that is an essential part. It's like having a movie with an actor without a 500 other people doing all the things necessary to, to make the movie work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, particularly doing this kind of job, you can't be a lone wolf out there, if you will. You do need a whole team uh, with support necessary for to help you be successful in your job. It was as if, and it wasn't as if, but for me, uh, the team was non-existent. Uh, not only that, but they were resistant to assisting me do my job. It was the, the attitude I think was, well, isn't it cute we have this African-American with us, but uh, we'll just shuffle them along to uh, help us look good with regard to uh, diversity. Um, so it, it, and it didn't make any sense to me because I was successful as a case officer, even with, even not having the tools as everyone else. Uh, so that, and it didn't they, make But the tools, sense. I mean, the tools you're talking about, are they mainly, are you mainly talking about the backup support, the team of people? The backup support, the team of people, uh, the, the credentials. Now, uh, it seems to me that the CIA is a culture. Yes, it is. And it, it seems to me that if you're a, a, a clandestine agent, then part of that culture is that team. I mean, I, I watch, I, I, I love all these uh, FBI and CIA shows on TV. It's always a team. There may yes. be one person up front, but there's always a whole team behind them of researchers and other people setting things up and what how uncommon was it for a, a clandestine agent to not have some something like that it was very uncommon uh, if not unheard of while i was there and as i was going through training to be a case officer i saw uh and witnessed and was a part of that support team for those officers out in the field yet when it came time for me uh to launch my career in the agency you know, I was having to beg for support. And even when I would not receive it, um, it was, I would still continue to try to do my job. It didn't, I mean, it did not make any sense to me. The only difference between me and those officers that I saw receiving the proper support and the proper tools was the color of my skin. I did not look like them. Uh, in many positions in the agency, I was the lone black face. Um, I, I would think that most people would say it would be dangerous and even foolish to engage in that kind of clandestine activity without the full support of a team. Yeah, as I said before, I mean, there, there are no lone wolves. You can't be a lone wolf in that sort of situation. It, it can be dangerous uh, and is dangerous uh, uh, to do that type of work without support. Um, and, and for me, uh, again, why it didn't make any sense that I was not provided the same tools or not treated like other officers. I had proven myself before. I was able to go to places without anyone ever suspecting that I was a CIA officer. Uh, as I've said on some of, some of the talks that I've had, you know, I do not look like Jack Ryan. Um, no one, wherever I went throughout the world, had any inclination that I worked for the CIA. I was good at my job. Yet those successes that I had didn't seem to matter uh, to my supervisors and the agency in general. Uh, it just seemed like I was a uh, sort of pet project uh, to be kept aside in the corner, uh, just to be brought out maybe to make the organization look good with regard to diversity. Now, you, know, the, the, you were 
trained to be an expert in Farsi, so you could be an investigator for Iran. Absolutely. To work with uh, having an influence and an effect there in Iran. And then they go and tell you, well, you're a black guy, you don't, you stick out. Why did you, why were you as assigned to cover Iran if, if they thought that? Uh, again, I, I think it's the uh, absurdity of bias. Um, I did, uh, I, I, I learned Farsi, uh, the Persian language uh, in uh, the agency. Uh, I was on the Iran task force for years. Um, and but as I'm going and trying to progress in my career, I ask why I was not receiving the same tools, why I was not being treated like everyone else. And the CIA being what it is and having no compulsion to uh, about its viewpoint on things, um, they flat out told me to my face that I kind of stuck out as a but big wait black a guy speaking I mean, Farsi. Are, are, are there blacks in, in Iran? In Iran? Yeah. Uh, there are people of color in, in Iran. There, there, there is diversity in I mean, that country. Would you stick out if you went to Iran? Uh, absolutely, I would not stick out no. as a, if I went to Iran. Um, Explain there, that. Uh, again, there was areas that I could go to. There's things that I could talk to with people um, out in the world uh, that you know, immediately they would not suspect that I was with the CIA. I was able to go into areas because I don't look like that typical CIA officer. You don't. Uh, I mean, and again, but, you know, I keep saying I, it, but I've I did had, prove I've myself had, with that. I've had my share of contact with people from Pakistan and Iran and what have you, and mm. and they're dark complected. You know, I mean, I can imagine if you had a, a big heavy beard, and and you wore something on your head. I mean, you could probably pass really easily. So what were they talking about? Uh, they were talking about their own bias. Uh, they were talking about their own prejudice about. Uh, you know, an African-American being a part of this elite group, the elite uh, CIA. And within the CIA, uh, the case officers are considered the elite. Um, and so what they were really telling me wasn't about my ability, but their viewpoint of me, uh, based on, only on their, their uh, bias about the color of my skin. Uh, and again, and I, I say it ad nauseum, but it absolutely made no sense. I was a resource for this agents, for the CIA, that the CIA did not want to use. Okay, so I want to jump forward a little bit. Okay. Uh, you, now you are identified as a whistleblower, but your history is a little different, and and your claims are very different. And you say that you were not the same kind of whistleblower as uh, as Chelsea Manning or Snowden or John Kiriakou, how are you different from them? The only difference is that I went through uh, official channels uh, with my complaints about discrimination and uh, uh, an, op an operation uh, while I was working the Iranian target at the CIA. Um, now we're gonna talk about uh, Project Merlin in, in a little bit. That's the operation you're referring to. Yes, it is. Um, and I, I think that is the only difference in mechanism. Uh, but to me, that's a slight difference uh, because, you know, as a whistleblower, uh, you know, someone who is bringing forward information about governmental wrongdoing, specifically with all the individuals that you've mentioned and myself, um, I, I don't think the, it is that important, the mechanism by which uh, whistleblowers bring to light information. Um, I am separated from them only in the, in the aspect, and I think it's a bright line, that I did go to uh, the Senate Intelligence Committee, the House Intelligence Committee, the, the avenues I was allowed to do. Um, but I don't see that as a big difference uh, between uh, myself and uh, other whistleblowers like uh, Chelsea Manning, John Kiriakou, a reality winner. And yet... Uh... You know, I've, I've been in, very involved in the whistleblower community over the years, and uh, a lot of whistleblowers go through the official channels, and yes. then nothing happens, and so they go outside the official channels. Yes. And, uh, I mean, so 
they, they went after you really hard considering that you did things the right way. But there's a little bit more to this piece. I mean, the front, one piece is I think you really pissed them off by filing a discrimination lawsuit against them. Yes, they were not uh, happy uh, yeah. with that. I went through the internal process with filing a discrimination suit, of course, the uh, equal employment opportunity process, the internal uh, process. And that was a completely one-sided affair. It was as if I didn't exist. Uh, all the glowing reports from my supervisors, the same ones who said I was too uh, big and black to be an effective officer. Um, so I decided to file in federal court. Uh, they were not happy about that at all. I didn't give them a heads up that I was going to do that. Uh, I pointed out to them that being a trained lawyer, that I knew exactly how to file a lawsuit and I didn't need the agency's help to do so. Uh, so they, they were not happy with me on. There was articles, uh, there was a news uh, interview as well um, with me just talking about the discrimination and of course not revealing any classified information. But the agency really was not happy with me uh, at that point. As okay, so, so you, you, you filed a discrimination charge in federal court, okay. Uh, yes. And you went, and now that was after you went through pr the process within the agency, right? Yes. Okay. And then uh, the, this Merlin project came up. Yes. Um, and of course, my involvement with Merlin uh, happened while I was uh, stationed, uh, based in New York. Um, and that was when things were really starting to get to a head with regard to the discrimination I was facing. Um, you know, as a part of Merlin, it, uh, we can talk about that now, I guess, a, a good transition to it. Um, that was an operation designed to thwart uh, the Iranian nuclear program uh, by instilling uh, flawed plans, uh, flawed plans for a nuclear weapon into their program um, the idea being they would use these flawed plans and it would set their program back uh, a number of years. So let me just, uh, so basically the goal was to somehow get to the Iranians, I believe it was through a Russian scientist, Absolutely. Uh, yes. some plans that were supposed to help them with their nuclear uh, weapons plans and develop scientific development, but that the plans actually were flawed, so they would have caused a delay in Iranian nuclear weapon development for several years. Absolutely. I would, the, the program had been longstanding uh, prior to my involvement. When I came on board with the program, uh, I was assured uh, that the plans were uh, flawed in such a way no one would be able to detect the flaw. And, the, and the, the Iranians would, if we were able to get the plants to the Iranians, they would use them in their uh, efforts to build nuclear weapons. Now, now this is similar in some ways to the, uh, the thing that they did with the Iranian centrifuges, which threw a virus into them that caused them to have problems. So there were multiple efforts to... Uh, sabotage the Iranian efforts to create a nuclear weapon. Absolutely. I believe that program you're talking about, and I wasn't involved with that one, uh, not much knowledge of it, uh, but was Stuxnet, I believe that Yeah, was. Stuxnet. That's it. That's Stuxnet. it. So, so you basically communicated with this Russian scientist who was the one who was supposed to transmit this uh, purloined scientific information to the Iranians, and what did he tell you? Well, he was, uh, just to back up a little bit, he was the intermediary. He was the individual that was, I trained, uh, I was handling. Um, to, you acquired him? No, he was already a part of the program when I came on board. Okay. Uh, my job was to train him in how to approach the Iranians, give him uh, ideas, push him in the right directions to reach out to the Iranians. Um, and the idea, he was a former scientist in the, in the former Soviet Union, uh, nuclear scientist. Um, and he was to be an intermediary, uh, an individual who would approach the Iranians saying, hey, I've got some plans to sell you, with the idea being, you know, he's just, he needs money, he's looking for money and things like that. Um, and the Iranians would 
check his bona fides out, see that he was a, a scientist, a nuclear scientist, uh, and trust the plans that he had available to them. Um, and the idea being also that he would not see or notice the flaw in the plans either. Uh, so the only individuals who knew what was really going on would have been the agency and even not uh, our asset, the intermediary, the Russian. Um, I trained him for a, a good while um, and really had him get some good contacts with Iranian uh, individuals of interest. So we were to the point where, okay, now we're going to give him the plans just so he had a basic familiarity with them. And of course, he already knew what they were, him being a nuclear scientist himself. So we, there was a meeting, um, the plans were shown to him, and the moment that they were set down on the table for him to take a look, he noticed that they were flawed. Um, that sent so many bells and whistles and alarms off in my head that I immediately turned to my supervisor in the calmest way I could to point that out and that that was something that I was assured would not happen, that anyone would be able to detect the flaw. Um, I was quietly uh, and later forcibly told to shut up uh, about that. And to me, why the alarms and bells and whistles were going off to me was that if we give these plans to the Iranians and they're able to immediately see that they're flawed, uh, scientists being who they are, they will fix them. So instead of hindering or hampering their nuclear efforts, we may have advanced them uh, by giving them key components to a nuclear weapon. Um, all of the assurances that I have been given uh, just faded away in a mist of lies, I, I guess, that were told to me about what this program was about. Um, so I, I started to make my uh, protestations known um, and that's when things really started heating up uh, with regard to the discrimination I was facing and the pressures I was facing. Now. So what did you end up doing? I believe you went to Congress? I went to, uh, first, initially I'd gone to the House Intelligence Committee about uh, my discrimination efforts, but to give them a sense of my entire career at the agency, I necessarily had to let them know about Operation Merlin. Uh, then. I also subsequently went to the Senate Intelligence Committee specifically and only about Operation Merlin. Um, I met with some staffers uh, there and explained every detail about Operation Merlin uh, that I knew uh, and my concerns. Was that, uh, was that something you were allowed to do that was legal in terms of the secrecy and what have you? Absolutely. Um, coming into the agency, um, they really train you on these are the avenues. If there's something you have to complain about, these are the allowed avenues by okay. which you can make your complaint. So no, one of them or two of them being uh, the House Intelligence Committee and the Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, they have the proper uh, clearances uh, to hear such grievances. Uh, even when I went to discuss uh, the issues uh, with regard to Operation Merlin, my attorney was not allowed to sit in on a meeting because he did not have the clearances to okay, hear. So we need so, to take a we need to take a brief break now uh, so I can put in the bumpers for the radio show. Okay. And then so we'll be quiet for 10 seconds and then we'll be back to 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 cover what happens when you talk to the Senate Intelligence Committee. And my guest for the show is Jeffrey Sterling. He's the former clandestine CIA case officer, also an attorney, and he was imprisoned for being a whistleblower. And uh, we're going to talk now about how you reported to the Senate Intelligence Committee staffers about the Merlin Project, which was an attempt to get a flawed plan scientific plan on building nuclear weapons to the Iranians. And what you discovered was it was flamingly obvious that there was something wrong with it. So what did the Senate staffers on the Intelligence Committee say? Uh, they assured me that uh, my discussing these matters with them would be confidential, um, that they would, would take serious anything that I had to say. 
uh, and that they would present the information to the members of the committee. Um, I said I wasn't looking for any assurances, any promises, and the reason that I had gone to the committee at that time was that we had just launched into uh, Iraq. And I had concerns that this flawed operation could create such a danger that our soldiers could, could have been walking into a situation of uh, an enemy having a nuclear weapon or even a dirty, dirty bomb, which was uh, a big concern during that time. So the timing on this, this was shortly after 9-11. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Okay. And uh, I, I had real concerns. Uh, by the time that I had been expelled from Operation Merlin, um, it, it was seemingly successful. And there was machinations about maybe we could do this somewhere else. Um, I, of course, did not know where else the operation had been launched, if it had been. But there could have been a real possibility that it could have been launched in Iraq. So, and, and you know, those, the, the, those, the whole idea of a plan that doesn't look like a good plan, where an agent reports to higher authorities, reminds me of Bill Binney. Mm -hmm. Bill Binney worked for NSA. He was an analyst who was involved in developing the software that was going to be used to track everybody communicating in every way. Yes. And he had built a system that worked, that not only worked, but that protected people's privacy rights so that it would only be used with people who it was authorized to be used on. And what ended up happening uh, in NSA is they went with another program that cost 10 times as much that mm -hmm. totally totally violated everybody's privacy and that's that's what they're using now and so Benny went and he complained about it and he uh and 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 so in, in a way what you you were doing was a very similar thing you were reporting on a program that you had reason to believe would not only work but that could further endanger american lives absolutely Absolutely. Yeah. And I felt a lot of impetus for me to go to the Senate Intelligence Committee about it was, I mean, I wasn't going, I wasn't trying to get back at the agency or anything. I had a real concern about the safety of our troops, a real concern about the dangers of that operation. And also, I felt, well, I wasn't allowed to serve my country in the CIA. Maybe this is a way I can finally serve my country. Uh, so I, I did, and eyes wide open went to the Senate Intelligence Committee. Okay, now there's another interesting piece of this whole story of yours, and that involves James Risen. Yes. Now, I've had him on my show twice. Okay. Uh, he's, and now he, he was a reporter for the New York Times, and now he writes for The Intercept, and he's an awesome guy. And you went to him and talk about your relationship with Ryzen. Okay. Um, it was during, uh, shortly after I filed uh, my discrimination suit in federal court, uh, Mr. Ryzen, then, as you said, working with the New York Times, was interested in doing a story about it. Uh, I met with him. I discussed uh, my discrimination case. Uh, I flat out told him when we first met, I will not discuss or disclose any classified information uh, to you about anything. Um, he was amenable to that um, because it, it was an issue of, of uh, public concern, uh, as I said, uh, with the discrimination going on at the CIA. Um, and even during the trial, it was disclosed that, I mean, the government admitted that nothing, was, nothing classified was disclosed in the article that Mr. Mr. Risen wrote about my discrimination case. Uh, so, and, and for me, I mean, Mr. Risen was, li he listened, uh, he heard, and he wanted to hear about the discrimination and, and kind of help me get that word out uh, about the discrimination in a you know, non-classified manner. Uh, so I had a history and contact with Mr. Risen, who subsequently uh, wrote the book, uh, State of War, uh, that had information about Operation Merlin. But he didn't get that from you. He did not get that information from me. 
Um, now, now just, what, Ryzen was treated pretty badly by Eric Holder, the U.S. Attorney General at the time. Hmm. And he was threatened with being jailed. Yes. And, and it was pretty serious and made major news. Yes, it did. And he refused to release the name of the informant who provided him with the information. Hmm. Was that you? It was not me. Uh, during, uh, it, I thought it was kind of interesting, uh, kind of disheartening for me as well. During the lead up to my trial, the information and and what Mr. Risen was going through and the threats from Eric Holder, um, I suddenly became, um, and I wasn't even a part of my own trial at that point. I was just an observer uh, looking in, from the outside in. Uh, to many in the mainstream press, uh, the trial became the Jim Risen trial. I mean, he wasn't even a defendant. Um, Jeffrey Sterling was of no concern to the mainstream press. Uh, it was the protection of one of their own. Um, and that was quite disheartening for me, uh, having that. And then once the government decided not to call Mr. Rising and the threat was away from Mr. Rising, then all interest, any concern about the trial just fluttered, flittered away. Um, there was no more concern. And during the protection of Mr. Rising, there was no concern of whether I was innocent or guilty. Uh, it was just the sort of rallying around protecting their own. Um, I didn't matter. Uh, to them uh, in that instance. Uh, and, and that was uh, quite enlightening for me in, in a not very uh, good way. Uh, but it was, it was really an interesting dynamic uh, that was going on at that time. No, no, I just need to get a, a little time frame straight. Now, Mer the Merlin Project was 19... When, when, when was it again? It was 2001, two, three, when was that it? That was 2000. My, my involvement ended uh, in 2000. Uh, so the lead up and the launch of it was late 99, early 2000. All right. And when did you talk to the Senate Intelligence Committee staffers? I talked to the Senate Intelligence Committee staffers uh, a couple of years later, 2002, 2003. Um, I had, once I started complaining about uh, Operation Merlin, there was a whole process of kicking me out of where I was then based in New York. Um, and I was going through the process of the internal EEO process. Um, EEO? And I was finally able to get What is EEO? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. EEO? What's that? Uh, equal Employment Opportunity. Okay. Uh, the internal uh, EEO process. Um, and during this time, of course, then when the launch into Iraq happened, I felt a duty to go forward to the Intelligence Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, to discuss my concerns about Operation Merlin. Okay. And then when, when did it first show up that you were going to be charged in any kind of way? Um, there had been rumblings uh, shortly after I had gone to the Senate Intelligence Committee that the FBI and CIA were... Uh, pointing the finger at me of some supposed leak that I had no idea about. Um, and that it was all quite shocking to me. I, I felt, wait a minute, I did the right thing. I did what I was allowed to do. Now all, all of a sudden, I'm having these fingers being pointed at me that I've done something terribly wrong. Uh, it made absolutely no sense to me. Um, and then just years start passing. Uh, I'm not really knowing what's going on. I mean, and at the time as well, I was fired from the CIA. I wasn't able to find any work anywhere within the What was your justification for fi firing you? And when did that happen? Uh, I was fired officially 2002. And the justification was insubordination um, without any real substan substance to back that claim up. Uh, there was never any bad instances in my employment record uh, with wow. the CIA. But for when did they of, actually bring charges against you? With regard to Operation Merlin? Or? With regard to you uh, get, having to go to court? Uh, no, they did not. No, they did not. Um, when I filed, um, that went through the proper no, procedures. No, but they did well. eventually. So when did they eventually charge you? I was eventually charged, uh, I believe, late 2010. 
Okay, 2010. With violating the Espionage Act. Okay, so you were charged with violating the Espionage Act, and then you actually went to trial in 2015, right? 2015, yes. And when you were in trial, the judge admitted that they had no concrete evidence against you. It was all circumstantial. Absolutely. I mean, that, that was a pretty powerful statement for the presiding judge to say that there is no direct evidence here. Uh, but that just didn't seem to matter, not only for the government, uh, but even for the judge. Uh, it, it didn't seem to matter. It, it was a show trial of if the CIA says it, then it's true. So, you know, I, I don't have the exact dates put together in my head, but I know that with James Risen, his refusal to provide that information was used by Eric Holder to go to the federal court. And he got decisions that basically made it so that journalists are no longer able to use their privacy right their their, their, their journalistic privilege to claim secrecy. Absolutely. And that, that was one of the other uh sad things for me during my trial, the, the lack of attention by especially the mainstream media in general, because so much of the groundwork was laid during that to remove any protections that reporters thought they may have had, uh, anything that journalists may have thought they had with regard to protection, especially for their sources. But no one was paying attention. Um, that was a, an appeal, an interlocutory appeal that the government did to win that right or to win that uh, final decision that there are no protections for journalists. And that's um, huge. That is a huge attack on journalism absolutely. and the freedom of the press, really. And so I ask it, I ask it because uh, was, was Eric Holder behind your prosecution? Absolutely. And Eric Holder and then President Barack Obama. And Obama. Now, I, you know, it, I, I stopped supporting Obama when I discovered that he prosecuted more whistleblowers than all past presidents combined. He was a, a horror for whistleblowers. Absolutely. Why do you think he and Holder did what they did to you? I, it was easy, uh, I, I think, for them. Um, I've questioned the, the whole aspect of it, of course, through the years. Uh, I, as well as you, I supported Obama. Uh, little did I know when I voted for him that that was going to land me in prison. Um, that agenda of going after uh, whistleblowers, uh, I mean, of course, he didn't run. Uh, his campaign didn't state specifically that he was going to uh, prosecute whistleblowers like no other. Um, I, I think maybe it was a way for him and Eric Holder to save face with the establishment that was there with regard to the intelligence community, uh, other areas of the government. I think there has been a discussion of a deep state uh, sort of thing, but it, it doesn't make any sense. It didn't make any sense uh, for that president to have such a uh, enthusiastic uh, penchant to go after uh, whistleblowers. And I think in my instance, it was easy for them to do so. I were mean, there any people were there any people within the system who really were rabidly anti whistleblower? I mean, I I've, I always thought that Eric Holder was pretty bad. But were there other people within the intelligence community who were like, we got to get these guys? Uh, that's the, the that's the mindset of the CIA that I knew was I mean, there. They don't like anyone going outside uh of the bailiwick outside of the walls to discuss anything so anyone. they wanted to put the fear of god into anybody who even thought about it even if they i mean you didn't break the rules though no i did not but they yeah. wanted to scare the hell out of anybody who even thought about it and there's also wanted to make an example uh of me i had the audacity to stare up stand up uh, to the cia with regard to discrimination and then the further audacity to complain about an operation that I was involved in. Um, I, I think the CIA is so uh, protected up on its ivory tower, if you will. Um, they will want to get anyone who does anything that is beyond what the CIA wants people to know. Um, and so, and I think Eric Holder and, Pre and then President Obama uh, 
easily stepped into that uh, willingly uh, to appease the intelligence community, say, look what we're doing for you. you know? And uh, but, but again, going back to my prosecution, I, I do think it was quite easy. Um, I was being put on trial. Uh, I was the only black face uh, basically in the courtroom uh, at that time. And you know, President Obama was putting up an image of the outstanding black American, uh, Eric Holder as well. Uh, and for me, I didn't fit within that uh, imagery, that ideology. Uh, so it was easy. You know, the, the CIA uh, uh, going after or wanting to punish this individual who did something so terrible. And yeah. as a matter of fact, every CIA officer that was put on the stand, uh, I didn't look like any of them. Uh, they were all white. Uh, the only uh, black face brought forth in the trial was uh, Condoleezza Rice. Uh, again, I, with that imagery of uh, here's this upstanding African American, not like this lowly guy, black face sitting in the defendant's chair. Uh, it was a, a trial, of course, with, as we said, no evidence. Uh, but as I have said, the only thing that was proven beyond a reasonable doubt in that trial was that you know, I was African American. Okay, we need to take another uh, show uh, ID break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about your sentencing and how it compared to other people. My guest for the show is Jeffrey Sterling, former clandestine CIA case officer who holds a law degree from Washington University. And he's the author of... Unwanted Spy, the pr pros he's the author of Unwanted Spy, The Persecution of an American Whistleblower. So you were sentenced to 42 months in prison. Yes, I was. Com now, in your book, you talk about some other people who did worse things than you, who got no punishment. Uh, Nothing. Uh, you know, specifically, uh, Petraeus. General um, Petraeus. It's just amazing because that was going on at the same time as my trial. Um, and it was just two completely different systems of you know, criminal justice systems. Uh, there was a one that was heavy handed, laid the hammer down on me, but offered uh, nothing but a slap on the wrist to General Petraeus with tons of admitted evidence of his wrongdoing. He lied to the FBI, provided the information to his paramour, uh, classified information to his paramour. But for him, it was an easy out for him. You know, again, just a slap on the wrist. It didn't make any sense uh, to me other than here is that bias. Uh, the difference between the two um, with me, no evidence and that I did not uh, commit what I was uh, alleged to have done. Uh, Mr. Petraeus, who admitted to doing everything that he did, yet he gets a slap on the wrist. I go to prison. And you talk a lot of bit in your book about your wife, Holly, and yes. her role. Uh, once you got, apparently, during the trial, there wasn't that much attention. No. Uh, once you got to prison, Holly took to social media, and she helped you. Absolutely. I have realized for a long time uh, just how lucky a man I am and have been. Holly was my champion uh, from the beginning and now, and especially while I was in prison. Um, you know, she got the word out. Uh, while I was sitting in a desolation of prison, I just felt like everything was over. Uh, I still had contact with Holly on the phone, but then the letters started coming from people expressing support and solidarity with me. And that was thanks to the efforts of Holly. Uh, she gathered thousands upon thousands of signatures, marched to the White House to, to present those uh, to President Obama, asking for a uh, pardon or uh, commuting. Of did anything sentence. work? Absolutely nothing did. And so how I, much time did you serve? I served three and a half, uh, I'm sorry, two and a half years of a three and a half year sentence. So you served 30 months of a 42 month sentence, approximately. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you were released January 16th, 2018. 2018, yes. But you just finished your probation this past summer? Probation just ended this past uh, July. Okay, so um, that was the end of the, the balance of the 42 months term. You served probation for the rest of yes, it. Yes, it was. Okay. Yes. 
So what have you been doing since you got out? Well, uh, certainly working uh, on my book uh, that came out this past uh, October and uh, really trying to adjust uh, back to uh, society. I'm still looking for work. Um, and that's been quite a challenge in itself. Uh, I'm here in the Midwest, uh, which would be difficult having the background of CIA, you know, trying to find work, but now I have the scarlet letter of convicted felon. Uh, so it has been a very uh, hard challenge uh, trying to find work, but I remain hopeful that um, things are going to uh, turn around. Uh, well, someone will uh, you know, look to the content of my character, not the, the blemishes that are there on my record. Guy. Now you, but you were, you were terminated by the CIA or fired uh, in 2002, you said? Yes. What did you do then? What kind of work did you do then? Uh, well, again, that was when we launched into Iraq and there was the call out for uh, increased hiring within intel in, in the intelligence community. Um, once I was fired, I was reaching out to, uh, I lived in the DC area and the multitude of government contractors that are there. Um, I applied to, I, I felt like every one of them and every one of them turned me down. Uh, it seemed that there was interest. I mean, I was a Farsi speaking uh, case officer from Sounds the Sounds like you were blacklisted. Yes, I was blacklisted. Uh, it would get to the point where they would maybe try to verify uh, my employment. Uh, then the calls would stop. The emails would go unanswered. So you uh, didn't no find any work, work after the, after you were terminated? No, I, I lost everything. Uh, I had to pack my car up uh, with my remaining possessions, and I moved back to Missouri. Uh, for a while, I just lived in my car for you know, No one wants to go back to their hometown with their uh, tail between their legs. So, so you uh, haven't so had a done. job since 2002? Uh, no, since uh, 2010. I, once I did return to Missouri, I was still couldn't find work there. Um, and by happenstance, some good friends of mine had recently had a newborn. Um, and I, would, I offered to babysit or be a nanny for them in return for room and board. I really had nowhere to go. Um, and I'm so thankful for those friends for doing that. And, and during that time, uh, and that was difficult too, you know, I go from being a, a CIA case officer to a nanny. Um, it was quite humbling uh, for me. But during that time, I was able to get a job uh, as a fraud investigator with a major health insurance company. Um, so I really felt my life was turning around. I started there in 2004, and I was quite successful at that job. The investigations that I was a part of, I assisted the FBI with regard to many of the investigations. Uh, some of the Part D investigations I did uh, ended up in individuals being sent to prison because of the fraud that they were committing against the Part D program. Uh, so my life had turned around and I, I had another successful career. And when did you get that job? Uh, 2004. 2004. And then in 2010, you were charged and you lost that job or what happened? I was charged and indicted in late 2010. And of course, I didn't know about it at that time. Um, and I had just had knee surgery, knee replacement surgery uh, late that year, December of that year. And I was due to return to work in uh, January. Um, and I was goaded into coming back down to my job early. Um, and then at that time, the FBI arrested me in early January, 2011. And so since then you haven't had a job? I have not had a job since wow. then. Wow. No. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I was arrested in 2011. Um, and then just the years you know, were just falling away. Uh, it's just amazing, uh, trying to find work, not knowing whether this was trial was going to go forward. Uh, the drama with regard to Mr. Risen, uh, just the time passing. Uh, the government starting off saying that they didn't have a case unless they were able to call Mr. Risen. They win the appeal to do so, but then they don't call him. Um, it, it was all really having a sort of Damocles uh, hanging over my head, a very dark shadow for a long time. Yeah, that's horrible. So anybody out there listening, offer this man a job. That would be nice.
<laughs> so I have a couple other questions for yes, you. Yes, please. You've had some hard choices in your life. How have you made the decision to take the actions that you did to cross the threshold? I mean, it, it, some of the th things you've decided to do were really th things that you must have known might change your life. H how did that work in your mind? Well, it, it was how I was raised. Uh, my, my mother instilled in me a work ethic, a, a, a do what you know is right for yourself ethic, ethic within me. And that stuck with me throughout my entire life. Um, a, a theme for me, I, I think that I've had through everything is, uh, one of my favorite authors, of course, is uh, Shakespeare. And my favorite line from Shakespeare, uh, from Hamlet is, to thine own self be true. And for me, it's been that way from the beginning. Uh, of growing up, I wasn't doing things that blacks were so uh, black Americans were supposed to do. Um, I, I chose a different path uh, for myself because it was what I wanted to do for myself. Um, you know, joining the CIA. I mean, well, even before that, going to law school. Uh, I remember when I was accepted into law school, my grandmother, uh, I loved her dearly, uh, told me that uh, she felt it was okay that I went to college, but going to law school, that was something that just maybe above where black folks are supposed to be. Uh, so, but I was able to, because I wanted to stay true to myself, you know, push those uh, disagreements about me and how I wanted to live my life aside and, and push through. And all of that is also the impotence that I had uh, to be a whistleblower. To, to come forward uh, about wrongdoing. Um, I wouldn't have been able to look myself in the mirror had I not taken and done what I felt was the right thing to do. That sounds like a very lonely process. Were there any people in your life who helped you? Did you have any mentors, any advisors, anybody at all who was there for you? Uh, no, um, it, it just felt like it, and it did feel like a, really lonely journey uh, that I've taken. Even when, and, and I've never sort of, uh, never pushed myself away from anyone. I just had to focus on myself. But even when things were happening, uh, I heard about the rumblings of the CIA and FBI coming after me with regard to that leak. And just looking for help, I reached out to just about every civil rights organization uh, in the country. Uh, none of them wanted anything to do with me. I, I reached out to uh, every member of the Congressional Black Caucus at that time. Uh, the response was crickets. There was just no sound, uh, nothing at all. Um, even during the trial, uh, there was no interest by NAACP, uh, Rainbow Police Coalition, any civil rights organization, uh, nothing at all. So that just instilled the, the, the feeling that, you know, I was alone in this whole process. And what really hurt was one of the congressmen that I did approach um, told me after I said my concerns, I met with his staff, they basically said to leave the country, uh, run away. Um, I guess they were telling me that a black man in this country can't fight that kind of battle. And the only hope for me was to leave. Um, that, that hurt hearing an individual who was supposed to represent the people before the government to say to me, uh, his, through his staff, to run away. Um, that was something that was never going to happen for me, but that just opened my eyes to what I was dealing with. Um, what, if any, support was going to be out there, which turned out to be none. But as the process continued, uh, I, I did. Uh, find those individuals uh, who were supportive of me, mainly uh, my, my lovely wife, Holly. Um, and as people learned my story, uh, the individuals who wrote me in prison, um, those things uh, reawakened me that uh, there's still hope and that I still belong. Uh, did so you ever reach out to the whistleblower community? Did you, did you obtain whistleblower legal counsel? Uh, no, I did not, because I, at that time, 
you know, it, it's hard to even, I don't think anyone wakes up one morning and says, I'm going to be a whistleblower. Um, and, and for me, that, that process was, I was going to go forward through the proper channels. Uh, but at that same time, I had my discrimination case going. Um, and then it turned into, of course, a criminal case. Uh, so you think if you had gone to a whistleblower attorney, it might have changed things? I don't think it would have changed. Uh, there is the, the program or the structure of whistleblower protections um, in the country. But when you throw in national security, all of that is sort of thrown out the window. Uh, with yeah. regard to protections and what an attorney is going to be you able to do. You guys are treated with. the worst of all. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's just amazing. Uh, and, and, and so it was, I knew of the aspects of whistleblowing protections out there, but I didn't feel like it applied to me. Uh, it actually took a while for me to even consider myself as a whistleblower. Uh, especially when I was sitting in prison. And it's like, well, wait a minute, I thought I was, how could I have done the right thing and ended up in prison? I didn't feel like I could be uh, categorized as a whistleblower. But having that time, and I certainly had a lot of time in prison, uh, setting that noise aside of doubt, uh, I realized, yeah, I, I tried to do the right thing, you know, as a whistleblower, um, going the proper uh, channels that I was allowed. Um, so yeah, and, and I decided to wear that mantle of a whistleblower proudly. And um, now we have a whistleblower related to the Ukraine. Yes. Who apparently he did things the right way, according to the legal authorities, but there are members of Congress and the president, I mean, the president has literally encouraged somebody to kill him. Yes. Or, or called for his death. Yes. And there are many members of Congress and people on the right who basically question whether he's a whistleblower at all. Yeah. And so it, it, it puts your story into context because that's, he's another guy who did things the, by the law, by the rules, and he is being vilified for it. Absolutely. We, we don't know yet whether he'll end up in jail or not. Yeah, I, with the, the attention, I, I love that there has been attention given to whistleblowing uh, in it, but the, the whistleblower for that infamous phone call, there's been so many eerie uh, similarities to my situation with that individual. Um, when that individual filed, made his complaint known, um, the, the White House was notified and the Attorney General were notified, the very subjects of the complaint. That is similar to what I went through in that when I went to both intelligence committees, especially the Senate Intelligence Committee, I had no idea at the time that I was speaking to individuals who had a former or even then a current relationship with the CIA. Uh, and, it may, and it was so clear, especially through our trial, through my trial, that once I spoke with the Senate Intelligence Committee staffers, they immediately went to the CIA. So you were assured that you would be able to speak to them in confidence and they totally violated those assurances of confidentiality and went and reported you to the CIA. Absolutely, absolutely. And that may, may be a little starker than the, the, the Ukrainian call uh, whistleblower, but that is exactly what happened. All the insurances that they made to me, I think they, it, it really demonstrated the fallacy of whistleblowing protections in this country. So I, I want to kind of wrap up. We've got a couple of minutes left. You say mm -hmm. that the, this whole experience opened your eyes. And I'm interested in how going through this process got you to see the world, see the system with new eyes. Um, I, I guess it can be said that the, the way I viewed the system uh, you know, through my life was through rose color, rose tinted glasses uh, that there, there is a good system out there. Our, our government only works for the people and I wanted to serve uh, as part of the government. Um, the experience did open my eyes uh, a, a lot that there's this underlying element uh, in this country that may profess itself as being in the best interest of the country, but it turns out to be more of a just protectionist aspect. Um, that sort of disheartened me uh, about the country, but 
and of all places to sort of reawaken myself to the greatness of this country and the greatness of the people of this country was again when I was in prison uh, and people were writing me, expressing their solidarity and support. Um, that let me know that that country, that America that I was fighting for, it was out there and it was a place that I did have a place in, that I did belong to. Um, getting, you know, removing myself from the uh, cynicism of, of the government and the, establish, the establishment, if you will. Uh, so it's opened my eyes that there is a good country out there and I do have reason to love this country, uh, but you do have to fight for it. Uh, you do have to take a stand sometimes and it may not, the result may not be uh, favorable, but you have to be able to look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. And, and uh, do you, what do you have to say to somebody who may be in your shoes somewhere within the government in a corporation who is in the position of being told, no, we're not going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, what you're saying may be true, but we're going to ignore it or it, it, we don't care. What do you say to that person, that potential whistleblower? I, I say to that person, you stay true to yourself. You stay the course. If you have it within you to complain about something in the face of tremendous risk, even when they say no to you, you continue, you go through those avenues or take a path that you feel is best to do it, but you stay true, true to yourself. There, there's going to be tremendous risk, but... Um, and that risk the includes the effort by either the government or the corporation to destroy your life, to Absolutely. wipe out all your savings, take away your house, take away all your possessions, destroy your relationships with people you love. That's what they try to do. You're really lucky, actually, that your wife has stayed with you. So many spouses yeah. leave. Absolutely. I, yeah. Again, I, I count my blessings with regard yeah. to that. But yeah, I, I mean, maybe I'm more of an example of uh, why not to uh, take a stand. Well, every but, whistleblower, if you look at it that way, is really, but they do it anyway. We've got a wrap. My guest for this show has been Jeffrey Sterling, former clandestine CIA case officer, an attorney, formerly imprisoned as a whistleblower and the author of the book, Unwanted Spy, The Persecution of an American Whistleblower. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you.